Amen. So 1 Timothy chapter number 3, uh, the Bible reads there in verse 14, These things I write unto you, unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. And the sermon I want to preach comes uh, from those verses there, that thou mayest know how, to, how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church of God. And I want to preach a sermon this morning about expectations of behavior. Expectations of behavior. You know, there should be a certain level of uh, behavior that we as Christians uphold. You know, it's not, uh, it's not too much to ask that we as Christians, you know, uh, have a certain standard or a certain level of behavior. There's certain things that we do. There's certain ways that we conduct ourselves because of the fact that we are Christians. We are God's children. You know, we should try to, uh, you know, have a, a, a reputation as above reproach. Okay. And I'm going to preach some things that maybe at the end here get a little personal, might step on some toes a little bit. But, you know, this isn't one of those sermons I really enjoy preaching, but it's one of those things I think that I have to kind of make myself preach. And I've always, endeavor, you know, tried so far, and I've reminded myself often, I don't want to be a nitpicky person. You know, I want to be one of these people that nitpicks about things in the ministry because, you know, we're all humans. We all, there's all human, beha- you know, we all are, are subject to human nature and, you know, you learn a lot about human nature being in the ministry because you're dealing with so many people. You know, if you have a job where you're dealing with a lot of people, where, you're, where you're, uh, your job is directly with people, um, you're going to notice a lot of things about people. And, and not, not to say that it's bad or anything, but there's certain habits or certain things that we just do as human beings. There's just certain uh, uh, things that we do that maybe we could be better at. You know, there's certain behaviors that maybe we should check and make sure that it's right. Okay. And again, I don't want to be nitpicky because that's going to make the ministry a very long, arduous process for me. If I'm just going to sit here and be a critical person and pick apart every little thing that people do, you know, and, and, and vice versa. You know, if you sit there and you, every time you come to church, you're, you're saying it's the same blue shirt, it's the same tie, you know, he's looking a little shaggy, doesn't he have time to shave his neck, you know, which I've been pretty good about lately, okay? <laughs> You know, you, you could start nitpicking me, you know, and, and here's the thing. We're not, you know, it's going to make both of our Christian lives a very long thing, isn't it? It's going to make us just this drudgery, you know, of trying to, uh, and, I, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but try not to be nitpicky. i saying that because I kind of have to force myself to preach these things. You know, I was reminded like, you know, well, some of these things you have to talk about from the pulpit. Sometimes you just got to have that family meeting with the church, right? Sometimes you all got to get together and just kind of address a few things. Not a big deal, and just talk about things. Why? Because there are certain expectations of behavior that we have in the house of God. You know, there, <laughs> there's an expectation specifically in the house of God. I mean, that's what he's saying here. That's why he says, these things I write I unto thee. What's the purpose of Paul writing these things? Everything that's come up, chapters 1, 2, and 3, and, you know, the, the, the scriptures as a whole. These things I write unto thee, what? That thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the church of God. So there is a way that we ought to behave ourselves in the house of God. You know, the church isn't just a fun house, isn't a clubhouse. It's not just some place where we just come hang out. No, I'm all for the fellowship. I'm all for that, having a good time at church. But, you know, it's where the preaching of the word of God takes place. It's where we come together and we, you know, get together, we formulate a plan, we go out and we try to win the lost. Very serious work. It's a very, you know, grave thing. And that's one of the qualifications for the bishop and the deacon is that they be grave, that they be sober, right? Even their wives are to be serious people. That doesn't mean I have to walk around and never smile, never joke, you know, but when it's time to be serious, it's time to be serious. And there's certain things that we can't just let slide, you know, and sometimes somebody has to, you know, just draw attention to some things and say, hey, we need to deal with this, okay, and and just make sure that, uh, you know, we're meeting a certain expectation of behavior. I mean, that's what 1 Timothy 3 is written about. Now, of course, in the context, he's talking about, you know, these things are what? The things that he taught are, you know, that there's no other doctrine that is taught, that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies and so on and so forth. Uh, that, that, you know, chapter 2, that prayer be made for all men, you know, that, that Christ is the Savior of all men and that we should pray for all men that we might live, what? A quiet and peaceable life. These are the things that he's talking about. These are the things that should be taking place in our Christian lives. You know, that these are the things that we should expect in the house of God. This is the, the expectation of behavior in the house of God. The teaching of no other doctrine. The prayer for all men. You know, uh, it gets into chapter 2 at the end of the, you know, woman's adorning. And the fact that she's being in subjection. You know, that's not going to fly in a lot of churches today. But that is what Paul wrote in, in 1 Timothy. Right? And that, that is the expectation of behavior that is put upon men, women, so on and so forth. The qualifications for the bishops and deacons. You know, I can't just approach those and just say, well, you know, 
it was a different culture back then with Paul. You know, no, that's the word of God. You know, and I have to meet those qualifications. We're all given these expectations of behavior. It applies to every one of us. So there is an expectation of behavior within the church of God. Okay, if you would, I'm going to have you turn into several places this morning. Just try, you know, I don't, I don't know where I'll have you go <laughs> as we go, but just keep up with me. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, there are expectations for behavior in the church of God. You know, that's not, that's not some far out, you know, thing. That's not some, uh, you know, something I just made up. That's something that's found in scripture. You know, we could talk about, you're going to 1 Corinthians 11. How about 1 Corinthians 5? Where it talks about how we are not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, you know, someone who comes to church, not just some guy who walked in the first service here, you know, we got to grill him to find out if he's any of these things, if he's allowed to come back next week. I'm saying somebody that's been coming, someone that's known as a brother, that's saved, that is participating in the ministry, that is a, is a fixture, you know, that is somebody in, in the house of God, that it's just, you know, we're going to see them again. We know that they're going to be there week by week. We call this person a brother. You know, you're not, you're not going to consider the, you know, uh, the guy, you know, who first shows up a brother, right? Now, he, he very well may be a brother. You know, he's saved. He's a brother in Christ. You know, that's a term that we kind of start to use with people when we become familiar with them, isn't it? When we start to call them brother, it's because, you know, they're, they're part of the body here. You know, they're, they're part of the membership here. They, they attend church here on a, you know, on a regular basis. And it says that, you know, that we are not to call, if any man be called a brother, that we're not to have company with any man that be called a brother, if he be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or extortioner with such a one, no, not to eat. What is that? That's an expectation of behavior in the house of God, isn't it? Saying, hey, if you're going to come to church, you can't, you, there's certain behaviors you cannot participate in. You cannot be a fornicator. You can't be covetous. You know, and I understand we all deal with covetous to a certain degree, right? But he's talking about somebody whose just whole motive in life is making money. All they talk about is money. All they want is money, 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 money. And they make other people, you know, discontent with the things that they have. You know, that's a whole other sermon. Idolaters. You know, we can't have people coming here and say, hey, where, where can we set up, you know, the, the Mary statue in your church? It's not going to happen. All right? I'll tell, you, it's there. I'll tell you right where you can put her. There's a, if you go around the corner, there's this big green bin over there. And it's called the trash can, and you can just give her a good old chuck. You know, you can just throw Mary right in there. <coughs> that was for free. But then, um, you know, no drunkards. You know, we're going to have the, the hot dogs and, and everything here. I'm going to go buy some drinks. They're all going to be non-alcoholic. You know, we can't have people coming in here being a drunk. You know, if it's a brother or an extortioner, which I've never seen, I, I don't think. Maybe I have. I don't know. That's pretty severe. If you're coming to church and blackmailing people, you know, we're going to have an issue with that, all right? So, and these are, I mean, this is a pretty, I don't want to say this is a low standard, right? But this is, this is a standard, and it seems like this is, you know, pretty easy to meet, isn't it? You know, like, oh, if I got to go to church or I got to quit being a fornicator and a drunk and all these other things, it's like, yeah, th th those things are good for you to not be, you know? And why is that? Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And he says to cast out the leaven that you may be a new lump, right? When we let sin in, you know, and when sin creeps in and it's tolerated, it spreads to everybody else, you know, and when certain behaviors creep into a church, even if they're not sinful and they go unchecked, you know, that kind of becomes the, the, the culture of the church. That kind of becomes the, you know, the, the feeling that the church gets. That's just kind of the, 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 the atmosphere, if you know what I'm saying. It, it, so we have to keep certain expectations within church beyond just this. I'm just using this as a proof text to show you that there are expectations for behavior in the house of God, okay? The expectation of, you know, behavior in the church. How about the expectation concerning, you know, a person's personal appearance? A person's personal appearance. Look at verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. So this isn't about putting on, you know, women are supposed to wear hats to the church, okay? Because if you let them do that, they'll go crazy with it. You've seen those, you know, like they, they got the Sunday hat where it's just like <laughs> they take up three seats, you know? They gotta clear the door when they come in, right? That's not what it's talking about, right? But that would be immodest, okay? But that's again another. So he's talking about, hey, she should not what shave her head. She should not have short hair. That's what the Bible says, you know. And people aren't gonna like that, but you know what? Go ahead and not like it. That's what the Bible says, it, you know. If she's gonna be covered, if she's not gonna be covered, you know, her hair is given to her covering, then she should also be shorn. And I'm not gonna dive into all this. I'm just pointing out the fact that the Bible you know, over and over again, has expectations of behavior for us when it comes to in the house of God, our personal lives even, 
or you know, even our something uh, as simple as our appearance. You know, the Bible has certain expectations of behavior. You know, it even has it for the men. Look at verse uh, 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? Right? And that's a hypothetical question. Right? Sometimes they'll say, well, that's, you know, you'll, you'll, you might, you know, confront a guy about this and say, hey, does, the Bible says, does not even nature itself teach you? He'll say, no, it doesn't. Right? Well, that's not what he, he's not. He's not leaving it open. It's not an open-ended question. It's, he's saying, like, you know, nature itself teaches you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair. And anyone who's honest knows that's the case. Right? <coughs> Look at verse 15. But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. So I'm not going to get into all that about, you know, specific, the specifics of this. That's not the point of the sermon. The point of the sermon is this, is that the Bible teaches us that there's expectations for behavior when it comes to, in the church, when it comes to even our own, uh, you know, our appearance. How about expectations concerning our attitude? You know, that, that's something that's in Scripture. You're in 1 Corinthians. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 13, 1 Corinthians 13. <coughs> we should have a certain uh, attitude towards other people, shouldn't we? And here's the thing. Sometimes people get this attitude of, well, you know, I'll be real nice to people that I go to church with, but everybody else, you know, they can go to hell. <laughs> I'll treat them however I want. You know, I'll talk. It, that's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says in 1 Peter, you're going to 1 Corinthians 13. It says in 1 Peter, honor all men. Honor all men. You know, all men, you know, we should have some level of respect. We should treat, you know, a certain level of, of dignity, a certain level of courteousness. You know, that, that should be there. Okay, it says, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. There's a verse for you on the 4th of July. Uh, honor the king, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, look at verse 4. Charity, you know, which is a word for love, right? Charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity envieth not, charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not what? Behave itself unseemly. It doesn't do that which is unseemly. It behaves itself properly. It seeks not her own. It is not easily provoked. You know, it doesn't, you know, a person who has charity in their heart and loves their fellow man isn't just going to fly off the handle over every little thing. You know, we were reading First, uh, first Timothy chapter 3. What was the qualification there? That a, a bishop, what, must be patient. You know, the servant of the Lord, the Bible says, must not strive but be patient toward all men. You know, that's a qualification that's given you know, for the, for the bishop, but you know what? That's because the bishop is to serve as an example to the flock, you know, and, and we should understand that there's an expectation of behavior concerning our attitude. We should not behave ourselves unseemly. We should not be easily provoked, thinketh no evil, you know, think how we're going to get that guy back or, you know, whatever. The things, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I want to go back to my, my old um, hobby horse about road rage, but I'm not going to. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. What's he talking about in 1 Corinthians 13? He's talking about your attitude. He's talking about having a charitable attitude. You know, and you can read that and apply it a, 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 as, as, you, as you want. You know, that's really another sermon. Again, I'm just making the, the, the case this morning, before I get into the nitty-gritty here towards the end, about the fact that the Bible does teach that there are certain expectations of behavior, whether that be towards all men, whether that be, you know, concerning our appearance, whether that be in the church, there is an expectation of behavior. How about the expectation of behavior regarding some of our more personal relationships? You know, the Bible says honor all men. You know, that's kind of a general, uh, you know, commandment. That's just kind of speaking generally, you know, we should treat people well and kindly. We should not bring a reproach upon the name of Christ and have people say, every Christian I've ever met is a jerk, you know. That's, you know, you could apply this out soul winning. This is why I think it's very important when you're out soul winning to be a very courteous and kind people, even to people who do not respond in kind, who are not that way towards you. Even the rude, short, curt jerk who wants to just, you know, take advantage of the opportunity and treat you like dirt because you came to their door with a Bible in their hand, you know, or cuss you out in a language you don't understand, <laughs> which I've experienced, right? <coughs> we should not, we should always walk away, you know, courteously. You know, and, and, and say, hey, sorry to disturb you, and leave, you know, a good impression with them, right? And not just say, well, if they're going to act like that, then I'm going to act, you know, right back at you. You know, that's, you know, I'm rubber, you're glue, whatever you say, bounce on me, stick to you. That's not the way we should be. You know, this isn't a schoolyard, okay? This is a, this is a spiritual battlefield. You know, we're going out to, to win people to Christ. We don't want to just give people this idea that we're all just a bunch of jerks, Okay. So they, you know, that's generally speaking, the expectation concerning your attitude. But how about in more personal relationships? Okay, like how about the, the relationship concerning work? 
Okay, go over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter number 3. We're going to look at Colossians 3 several times uh, here in the next few minutes. So if you want to just keep something there. Um, I might have you go elsewhere, but go to Colossians 3 for now and, and keep something there. You know, we need to understand that there's an expectation concerning our behavior when it comes to our personal relationships. You know, perhaps, you know, a good example of this is when you're at work. You know, you should be careful about how you treat your fellow employees. You should be careful about how you treat the boss. Okay, Colossians chapter 3, look at verse 22. It says, Servant, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Now, who are your masters according to the flesh? That's talking about your employer, the person who you are employed by. That is, you know, another term for that, master in the flesh. We understand that we have one master, a spiritual head, which is Christ, right? But we, the fact is that while we're on this earth, we also have spirit or, or, or masters after the flesh. These would be people that have some level of authority over us on this earth, okay? And, you know, he says to obey them in all things according to the flesh. You know, this is, and it's to servants, to employees, not with eye service. So he gets, he's not just saying, you know, whatever the boss says, you know, Obviously, whenever an authority in our life tells us to, to, you know, we always appeal to the higher authority, right? If, if, if the boss wants us to do something sinful, I'm sorry, I obey, I obey the higher authority. My parents, uh, God, you know, the church, uh, the pastor, whoever. You know, if somebody's trying to talk us into doing something that would, that would uh, do some, you know, be something sinful, we should always appeal to the ultimate authority, which is God. But he says your servants obey your, in all things your masters. Now, what he's talking about, he gets real specific, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. You know, if the boss is telling you, to, com commanding you to do something work-related, you do it. You know, if he says, hey, get this done, you go do it. Now, if he tells you to go shake an aerosol can until it quits rattling, he's messing with you. Okay? Cause then <laughs> that's called a joke, right? But you know what? You'd probably be that guy. Well, that's what he said. You'd be out there just shaking that can, right? But he's saying, look, not to not to obey them, to obey them in all things, not with eye service. You know, I'm not just going to be the guy that gets busy whenever the boss comes around. You know, the boss comes around, and now it's time for me to start, you know, working hard. Okay. And look, guys that don't understand this do not excel at their job, because employers, you know, um, you know, this is why managers exist, because they have to employ managers to make sure other people work. That's what a manager's job is—to manage other people. To make sure they show up on work on time, they work a full shift, that they weren't slacking, that they, you know, had a good attitude. That's what managers do. You know, they do other things too, but that's a big part of their job. Because, you know, there's something about human nature, whenever, you know, at, whenever the cat's away, the mice will play, as the saying goes, right? But that should not be said about us. You know, the expectation of our behavior when it comes to our work is that we don't need somebody standing over us with a ta like a taskmaster, you know, beating the drum, cracking the whip, making sure we're doing what we're supposed to do. You know, and you can apply this with kids. You know, children at home, that, you know, if you want to get on your parents' good side, you know, obey them in all things and not just with eye service. Oh, mom and dad are around. Let me just start behaving correctly. You know, mo we all, you know, oh, mom, mom and dad, they're, they're coming home. Quick, let's do all the chores we were supposed to do over the last eight hours while they were gone. You know, let's get them done. They're on their way. They'll be here in 20 minutes. Let's do the dishes back in the floor, clean the yard, you know, do all these things that we had all day to do, right? That's called eye service. You know, you should have just done those things immediately, you know, and then you could relax when they came home. It wouldn't be the stressful thing, right? <laughs> so he's saying here, look, you should not, you should be, uh, obey them in all things, as, uh, and not with eye service as men pleasers. You know, that's what these guys do. Oh, the boss is here. Let me show him how hard I work. Ah, you see me, boss? Ah, you see how hard I'm digging? Then he's gone, and it's like, well, let me just leave him that shovel, you know. And we've all known people like this. He says, in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. This is the expectation of our behavior when it comes to work. To do whatever we do heartily as unto God. You know, if you went to work or you were at home and you had this attitude that everything I was doing was as unto the Lord, you know, you wouldn't, this would just all fall into place. You would be obedient. You wouldn't, be, uh, you wouldn't do things with eye service. You would, say, you would understand that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. That, and, and then that would just you know, make you want to work. You, you, you would constantly, you would be doing everything heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. You know, if you're only going to do things as unto men, then you're only going to care when men are watching. That's the only time, you know, whenever men are going to notice whether or not I'm working hard. If you do it unto the Lord, you're not going to care if anybody notices or not. Knowing that ye are, <coughs> knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the long which he hath done. And that's important to understand because sometimes these I've known people go to work 
and, they want, and, they're, and they're bad employees. They're Christians, they're saved, and they go to work and they're bad employees. And when the boss fires them, or when the boss comes down on them, they, they want to act like it's persecution. Oh, I'm being persecuted because I'm a Christian. It's like, no, it's because you're a bad employee. You know, being a Christian does not make you a good employee. Now, make, being a Christian should make you want to be a good employee. That's what he's saying here. That is the expectation of behavior. But don't think that that's just automatic. That's something you have to work on. That's something you have to make happen. And he's saying, look, if, if understand this, verse 25, he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. You know, if you go to work and you're a, a bad employee, don't be surprised if your pay gets docked. Don't be surprised if you get sent home early. Don't be surprised if you get fired, okay? Why? Because there is no respect of persons of God. Or excuse me, there is no respect of persons. That's what it says there in the end. Right? He's saying, look, if God's going to reward you according to your work. If you're a bad employee, if you don't do things heartily, if you do things with eye service, if you're just a man pleaser, don't be surprised when your attitude, you know, comes back around on you, okay? <clears throat> the Bible says, go over to, you're still in Colossians 3, right? The Bible says, servants be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and the gentle, but also to the forward. You know, we should say, well, I'd be good to my boss if he were good to me. You know, I'd work harder if they pay me more. You got, I've literally heard people say that. And I've heard other people tell me they've heard other people say, apparently this is some kind of an attitude that's out there. I'll work harder when they pay me more. Well, just prepare, be prepared to never make more money. Because do, do you think that's how an employer thinks? You know, I'd pay that guy, I'm going to pay that guy more so he'll work harder. That's not how it works. That makes no sense. You get paid more when you work harder. You know, when you're the first one in, last one to go, when you're willing to do the overtime, when you're willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done, when you're the guy who comes with answers, not problems, who comes up with solutions, you know, when you, when you put forth an, a sincere effort to make the company money, you make money in return. Why? Because that's, there's an expectation of behavior, even from your employer. The employer has an expectation of behavior from you. They, they have an idea of what a good employee is and what a good employee isn't. And if we could figure out what a good employee is, which is what Colossians 3 is telling us, you know, then we will succeed. But even if we don't, even if we're a good worker, we're diligent, we do everything heartily, it's unto the Lord, you know, and we're just not appreciated work, you know what, we still, we're, we're doing it unto the Lord, and you know what, there's a, a reward with God. He is not forgetful to forget our, he's not, he will not forget our labor and, and work of faith. You know, he will reward us. So that's one area. We're talking about expectations, behavior, you know, in our personal relationships, such as at work. Well, what about this one? What about in marriage? There's, you know, there's expectations of behavior within marriage. The Bible lays it out. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. This is not popular. Colossians 3, 18. Wives, submit unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. You know, that, the Bible is not a feminist book. You know, sorry. I'm not sorry, actually, right? And if you don't like that, well, tough. You know what I mean? And, and I'm telling you something. There's people out there, ladies, that do not like this. I've yet to meet a man who doesn't like it, right? There's probably a guy who would, you know, some liberal, you know, soy boy that would try to, you know, make himself out to be some, you know, bleeding heart for the women and say, oh, yeah, it's so oppressive, you know, and, you know, try to impress somebody. But, you know, I, if you, if most guys probably appreciate that, that, that God put that in there. Repeatedly, by the way, we're going to look at it. But uh, it says, wives, submit your, unto your own husbands as it's fit in the Lord. You know, and I've known, I've heard pastors get up and say, I preached that, I preached, you know, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 3, Ephesians 5, and I've had women come up to me after the church, she said, and she said, look what I did, and she took her Bible, and she took a black marker, and she just went <coughs> right over that. He's literally, I'm not even, like he said, she walked up, and she said, look what I did there. I just took, I didn't like that, so I just took this Sharpie, and I went, Pfft. well, shame on you, you know, shame on you for, for despising the word of God. Colossians chapter, and I bet she's got a great marriage, by the way. I bet her husband is just a, just a very happy guy, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> I was laying the sarcasm on thick there. Hopefully you picked up on it. Uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Now, it's fit in the Lord. What is this? It's an expectation of behavior for wives. And that is that they are to submit un themselves unto their own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. They say, well, that's not what the university taught me. You know, that's not what my, my mother taught me. It's not what my grandmother taught me. My, my aunts never taught me that. You know, I, I was watching, you know, that's not what Hollywood taught me. Yeah, but it's as fit in the Lord. If you want to please all them, go ahead. You know, go ahead and, you know, don't be submissive to your own husband. You know, try to rule the roost and everything else and, and go against the grain and fight him on everything. And, but you know what? The Lord's not pleased. And you might, you know what? You might please all your girlfriends. You might please 
uh, you know, all the other ladies in your life. You might please all these other people, but you're not going to please God. Because this is what the Bible says, it is fit in the Lord. It's an expectation of behavior that wives should submit unto their own husbands. Well, that's not very nice. Well, that's why it says in verse 19, husbands love your wives. Husbands love your wives and be not bitter against them. You know, husbands should be forgiving. They shouldn't harbor grudges. They should let things go. And they should be patient and kind. And, you know, they should not, they should not you know, they're the head. They're the authority. You know, that's what the Bible's teaching here. But it doesn't mean that they have to be this, you know, this, uh, you know, vindictive dictator. It was just the self-serving, selfish individual. You know, because wives are to be submissive under their husbands, husbands, you know, this is their expectation of behavior, that they should honor their wives. As, and, they, and they should, you know, love them as unto what? The weaker vessel, right? And that they should love their wives and be not bitter. They, they should be a, self, a selfless leader, right? They should, they should lead as a servant, you know, and that's, this is a whole other sermon. I'm just trying to make the point again and again and again that the Bible teaches over and over and over again that there are expectations for behavior in the church in our, about our appearance, about our attitude, about our roles at work, about our roles within the home. Keep something, Colossians 3, go over to Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to park it on this point in a minute because this is something that needs to get drilled home today in, the, in 2021 America. You know, in, in this modern world that we're living in where it's just, you go girl, you know, you're, you just go be a CEO, go become, be a lawyer, be a doctor. You know what? Go ahead and be all those things. Go ahead, put on the par power suit, you know, walk up and down the halls and, and, and be, be the boss and boss people around. If that's what you want. But just understand it's not pleasing the Lord. Okay, that's, that's available. But if you want to be somebody who pleases God, if you want to meet that expectation of behavior, this is what it is. Okay. The Bible says, you're going to Ephesians 5, it says in 1 Peter 3, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if obey, any obey not the word, they may also without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. What he's talking about? A, a saved lady, right? A saved woman who's married to an unsaved man. You know, her conversation can win her husband. What's he talking about her conversation? Not, not the way she's going to tell him off, you know, their conversation. Conversation is like conduct, the way you carry yourself, the way you behave, right? He's saying, look, you can win your husband Thou saved wife, you can wait, win your unsaved husband by the way you behave. By what? By sub, being in subjection to your husbands. That if any obey not the word, right, they may be one by, without the word. While be, they what? Behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. He's saying it's not the outward man that you need to adorn if you want to, you know, win that husband. You know, he should be uh, you know, beholding your conversation and then you're not just about spending all his money so you can have another pair of shoes or whatever, right? He's saying you're going to be somebody who's chaste, conversation coupled with fear. What is this? It's an expectation of behavior from the Word of God for wives. And husbands, we looked at that too. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the Savior of the body. So, you know, I'm going to park it here for a minute because it's important to understand this. How much is the husband the ruler of the home? How much authority does he have over the wife? Complete authority, 100%. So how do you know that? Because it says, even as Christ is the head of the church. He says that the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. How much is Christ the head of this church? 100%. Now, you know, obviously there's an under-shepherd. There's somebody that's appointed to preside over the services, to guide and direct things, but it's all, you know, as, as I see fit according to the Word of God. Making sure that we're lining up with what the Bible says. Making sure we're doing things biblically according to the, you know, the mandate that Christ has given us in the Word of God. That's, you know, that's the, the, the leadership here, right? But the point I'm trying to make here is this, is that a wife should be as much submitted to her husband as the church is to Christ. Meaning this, like, what, what would we do here where we'd say, well, I know that's what Jesus said, but you know what? We kind of want to have it our own way. We're going to share authority in this area. You know, we're, we're going to go ahead and let, let the ladies do the preaching, even though the Bible says not to do that. We're going to go ahead and get a different Bible, even though the Bible says that this is the preserved word of God for English-speaking people. You know, what, we're going to stop soul winning, even though Jesus commanded that we go into all the world. Well, you know, I know that's what he said, but we just have a different way of looking. We just do things a little differently here then we're not in subjection to Christ, period. You know, and if a wife's going to fight her husband and resist her husband and say, well, I know that's what he, what he wants done, but I'm going to do it my way, then you're not in subjection, okay? 
<clears throat> Look at verse 24. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. I mean, this is complete submission. This is, this is complete obedience that he's talking about here. That's how much the church is supposed to be subject unto Christ. He's saying, even so should the wives be to their own husbands and everything. And then again, verse 25, he always follows it up. You know, the guys don't just sit back and go, ha, ha, ha. Now I got her right where I want her. The Bible says that she's me subjection. But what does the Bible say in verse 25? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Yeah, the wife is be, to be subject unto uh, under the, uh, the husband, even as the church is subject unto Christ. But how, was, how did Christ treat the church? He gave himself for it. He died for it. He sacrificed. You know, he put the church first above himself. And that's the way husbands should love their wives. You know, not just, you know, I'm going to love my wife and get her a box of chocolates on Valentine's Day. It's, you know, everything you're doing, you know, everything that you're trying to do is for her benefit. You know, you're caring for the things of your wife that you may please her, right? You're, you're trying to love her, guide her, you know, give her the things that she needs to, to do her job and things like that. We, we get that, okay? This is, I don't want to turn this into the whole sermon, but, you know, just making the point that it just doesn't, this doesn't give, you know, the husbands the right to just be jerks. And look, if you got the, if you, if you married the jerk, I'm sorry, but you married the jerk. You know, that's, that's just, I'm sorry. But that's the way it is. And, you know, will I have to be subject to him even if he's not? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. That's what the Bible says. Okay. You know, and again, you could win him over. Maybe you could make him a better person. Maybe you could make him want to fulfill his role as God, as, 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 that God has given him by fulfilling your role. Okay. And he says that he gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the, washing of the, by the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot nor wrinkle nor any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives even as their own bodies. He that loveth them, uh, his wife loveth himself. You know, we should treat our wives just as good as we would treat our own selves. Okay? Nevertheless, it says in verse 33, let everyone in particular so love his wife even as himself and see that the wife reverence her husband. You know, if... If, if husband and wife would live up to these expectations of behavior within marriage, they'd have a wonderful marriage. I'm not saying they'd have a perfect marriage. I'm not saying there would never be bumps in the road, you know, uh, irons and wrinkles that need to be ironed out. But you know what? They'd have a godly marriage that glorifies Christ is what they would have. Okay? Now, how about another personal relationship where there's an expectation of behavior is with children. Okay? With children. You know, we should have certain expectations of behavior with our children. Go over to Ephesians. Keep something in Colossians 3. Uh, actually, you know what? Yeah, go to Ephesians chap chapter 6. Keep something in Colossians 3. We're talking about expectations of behavior. You know, we should have certain expectations of behavior for our children. You ever, you ever known anybody that doesn't have expectations of behavior for their children? You can see them a mile away. You, you can, oh, I could say, well, that's right where their expectation of behavior is. Because, you, you, and it, you know, it's because of how the child behaves. You just look and say, well, let me see what this kid gets away with. And then I can look at the parent and say, well, that's what they expect out of him. Because here's, here's the thing about kids. They'll do exactly what you train them to do. You say, I can't believe you say that. You know what? People you train your kids. People spend more, put more effort into training horses and dogs than their own children. And it's a shame. You know, because you're forming, you're, you're, you're molding, you know, people are going to become adults one day. They're going to carry all those behaviors. They're going to carry all those attitudes, all those things that they were taught as children right into adulthood, for better or worse. So, yeah, you should train up a child in the way in which he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. I mean, do we need to go to Proverbs and look at all the verses? It talks about spanking your children, correcting them, you know, and all the instruction that's given to a son in the, in the book of Proverbs. You know, so there is an expectation for children and their behavior. You know, that's not an, an outlandish thing to say. You know, that's not something that's far out there. That's what the Bible teaches. And people don't want to have expectations for their children because it's hard work to have expectations for your children, to get certain types of behavior from your children, isn't it? Because it doesn't come naturally. Trust me. <laughs> you gotta, you got to instill that in them. Anyone who has kids who's tried to do this knows this is the case. That, you know, kids are taught, no one has to teach a child how to do wrong, how to lie, how to cheat, how to steal, how to misbehave, how to get out. That's sinful nature. What has to be instilled in them is the correct behavior, meaning you have to have that expectation. That's why when I see a kid who's just acting up, you know, consistently, and look, I know all kids have bad days. No kid's perfect. You know, all kids, you know, no, 
Every, they all have to be worked on and so on and so forth. But when you see children who are just consistently, it's the same behavior over and over, I just mark it down. I don't, I don't get mad at that kid and say it's the parent who's at fault because that's their expectation, you know, that they're going to let them get away with whatever, okay? There's a certain threshold. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. I love the way, every time I read this, especially, you know, I always point this out because this is important to understand. Children. Who's the Bible addressing here? It's addressing children. It means all you kids that are, you know, busy fiddling with something or, you know, not looking up here, need to look up here right now. Okay? All the kids in the room should be, have their eyes on me because the Bible is addressing you. You know, and here's another reason why, you know, it, it, this is proof that it's good to have children right here in the, in the, in the, in the auditorium with us, isn't it? Because you got Paul saying, make sure you tell the kids. Because remember, the, the, the epistles were to be read before the churches. He said, make sure you send somebody over to the junior church to, to remind the kids, too. <laughs> no, he said children. I'm just assuming all oh, the kids are going to be right there in the service with them. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. You know, not a lot is put on kids in the Bible. It's really just that one thing. But you know what? It's kind of a big ask, isn't it? Because <laughs> your parents are going to ask a lot of things. You know what I mean? They're going to have a lot of expectations and behavior. And, and here's the thing, and I'm going to get into this in a minute. You know, I'm just making the point in the sermon that there are expectations of behavior that are very clearly lined out, very specific expectations of behavior. I mean, good night. We were talking about appearance, you know, hair, length of hair, the way we dress, you know, uh, roles in marriage. These are very specific expectations. But Paul here, when addresses the children, he just says, obey your parents in the Lord. Meaning this, that there is, you know, there, there, there's, there's liberty there with that parent and that child to say, this is what I expect. He doesn't just say, you know, obey your parents and parents, here's what you should expect from them. The only these specific things. You know, what, what flies in one household might not fly in another. One expectation of behavior in one house might not be the expectation of behavior in another house. Doesn't mean one's right and one's wrong. It just means they're different, okay? So there is a little bit of wiggle room there, okay? But he is saying to the children that whatever your parents, whatever rules they put in place, obey. Not say, it doesn't say obey what you like. Obey when it's easy. Obey when it goes along with what, what, you, what you agree is correct. It just says obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Meaning this, that not obeying your parents is not right. It's sin, okay? Chapter 2, or excuse me, verse 2, Ephesians 6. Honor thy father and mother. Man, that sounds familiar. Where else have I read that? Oh, yeah, it's the fifth commandment. You know, it's number five in the list of the ten commandments. You know, there's a lot of things that people might do that are sins that aren't as bad as others, but when, it's, when you're breaking one of the Ten Commandments, when, when that's like when God calls Moses, Moses walks all the way up Mount Sinai twice, he's up there fasting for days, weeks, over a month, 40 days, you know, God's there with thunders and lightnings and thick clouds and black darkness and trumpets. I mean, it's just this fearful sight, and he's writing out Ten Commandments. If this is one of them, it's pretty serious. God takes it very seriously, okay? Now, we might not think that, but it's, it's in here. I mean, that's one of the Ten Commandments. He says, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. It's the fifth commandment, but it's the first one with what? With promise. That if you will, what does it say there? Verse 3, that it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. See, kids, sometimes they think that parents have rules or expectations for behavior in the house just because they're ruthless dictators. You know, who just, who just want, who, who we just, oh, all my kids are just little slaves, you know. <laughs> I just had you so I could get somebody to take the trash out, right? I just had you so I could, somebody else could go get the mail for me, right? That's why, that's why you had me. You just want someone to do all your dirty work so you could, you know, uh, do other things. Oh, like pay the bills, you know. Your day's coming for that too, by the way, but... Um, but no, he's saying that it may be well with thee. You know, if you obey your parents, it's going to go well with who? With you. Now, it's going to go well with parents too, isn't it? They're going to be happy. Everyone's getting along. Things are going to go well. But this has a promise in it, that it may be well with thee. Meaning, who's going to bless you? That it may be well with thee, and that thou mayest live long on the earth. Who's going to give you long life? Your parents? No, God. God's going to see it and say, you know what? That person obeyed their parents. They were obedient. I'm going to give them long life, and it's going to go well with them. Right? So that's, a, that's the promise. But what is this? This is an expectation of behavior for children. 
And then, you know what? And he gives one for the fathers too, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, fathers are to nurture their children. They're to admonish them in the Lord, to teach them the word of God, to, to teach them you know, right from wrong, so on and so forth. But he says there to not provoke them to wrath, to not provoke their children to wrath. What is, what is he saying here? I mean, you know, we should have expectations for our children, for their behavior, but they should be reasonable. They should be ones that they can actually attain. You know, we've all heard of the, the proverbial disgruntled son who is never good enough for dad. You know, everything I did, you know, why couldn't you be more like your brother? Why, you know, whatever. You know, he just, everything I did was never good enough. He's mad, right? He's provoked under wrath because they have this expectation of behavior that's unattainable. You know, we should not have unattainable expectations of behavior. But here's the thing, you know, I don't think anyone in here is probably guilty of that. You know, if anything, I, what I see more often is people have too low of a standard for expectations of children. You know, when you hear a parent calling for their child's, like, over and over and over and uh, like for just over and over again come here come here come here come here come here it starts to sound like a bird come here come here come here you know it's 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 the that's the parent geek or whatever <laughs> try to say parrot geek parent anyway right but it, it's just like you, you i go well that standard's too low you know how many times i call my kids once you know i try to try to hold them that standard and if they don't come, you know, then there's repercussions, right? That should be the expectation of behavior because that's the expectation they're going to meet. You know, you know, the parent that's consistently calling out for their kids to come here, it's because you trained them to be that way. They know that, okay, that's the 12th time. Okay, now they're going to start walking over here, right? They're going to start counting down from 10, and then I'll behave. You know, that's, that's the expectation you've put upon that child. That's what they're meeting. They're meeting your expectation. Because you're expect and you say, well, it's so frustrating. Yeah, because your expectation is too low. You need to raise it. And there needs to be consequences when they don't meet it. Okay? And again, it needs to be a reasonable expectation. I don't think expecting your children to come the first time you call them is an unreasonable expectation. They should have that level of respect. That when, when mom and dad say, hey, come here, it's not, no, it's a second. Okay, what? They call back from the other room, what? I'm not having a conversation from uh, throughout through the house through the walls. Come in the room and talk to me, you know. So that that's uh, you know that's a whole other sermon right there. But I'm just trying to make the point that there are expectations for behavior. We should have them for our children. This is a very important. <coughs> the Bible says you're in uh, Colossians chapter three verse twenty. This isn't just a one-off. He addresses the children again. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well pleasing unto the Lord. So how how can I as a child please God? You know, I don't, go, I, don't, I don't get to go out and do all the soul winning. I'm not going to be doing the preaching. You know, there's not, I don't feel like there's a lot I can do as a child to please God. Well, you know what? The good news as a child is that God has not put a lot upon you directly. The one thing he's asking you to do in Scripture is to obey your parents. And that if you'll do that, you'll be what? Pleasing unto the Lord. You want to please God, kids? Obey your parents. Obey them. And do it, don't, you know, not, and here's the other thing. Well, I'll obey my parents, but I'm not going to like it. Go do, go do this. You know, take the trash out. Oh. <laughs> and look, you know, I, I'm guilty of all that. I mean, I, I, I look back on the way I behaved with my mother, and it's like, no wonder she took the broom to me. No wonder she, you know, got mad as she did, because I had a terrible attitude. And I feel bad for it. I wish I could go back and change all that, but I can't. You know what I mean? But I could see why that's so, now that especially that I have kids, you know, that I could see why that would be so frustrating. When kids, you know, every time you ask them to do something, and it's just like, oh. <laughs> <sighs> the eye roll, the exasperated sigh, it's so annoying. It, it's irritating. Because you're not asking much. You know, I, I doubt parents are asking, uh, like, some unreasonable standard of their children when it comes to their behavior. There's no need for any of that. Do it. You know, when, when, you, when, you're, when you have an opportunity to obey your parents, kids, you know, you should look at that as an opportunity to be pleasing unto God. Oh, great, here's an opportunity to, to please the Lord. My parents want me to do something that, you know, maybe it's not something I want to do. Maybe it's not something I'm real excited about. Maybe it's going to be hard. Maybe it's going to make me uncomfortable. You know, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway because I want to please God. And that will help you have a good attitude about it. When you understand that you're, you're pleasing God when you have that good attitude. 
you know, if you say, hey, I'm going to obey my parents, and if I do with a good attitude, God's going to be pleased with me, it's going to make it easier for you to have a good attitude about doing it. But if all you see is, well, my, I'm just doing it because my parents are making me. Well, do it because you want to please the Lord, and it'll be easier for you to do. So let me just make an application here a little bit more generally to all of us here at the end, okay? I'm talking about expectations behavior. We looked at how there's expectations behavior when it comes to our you know, our dress standards, our behavior towards other people, our personal relationships at work and marriage as children. And I've laid all that out because I wanted us to understand that it's not unreasonable that there's an expectation for us as church members. You know, as members of a local church, it's not unreasonable to think that there would be an expectation of behavior beyond just what, you know, 1 Corinthians 5 says, okay? And, and where even we can have a little bit more liberty here to, to say, look, this is the way we do things in faithful word. You know, this is the way we, we don't do this. We do do this. You know, please abide by that, okay? I don't think that that's unreasonable. Say, well, where in the Bible does it say this? Where in the Bible does it say that? Well, you know, it doesn't, doesn't lay out every little thing that parents can and can't expect from their children, can it? It doesn't say it lay out every single thing that parents or that husbands can and can't expect from their wives in terms of behavior, does it? There's liberty there, okay? So I don't think it's unreasonable that there is an expectation within the local church for behavior. I mean, there's certain things we should or should not do, okay? How about, how, and here's one of my first points, okay? And I'm going to go through this real quick. How about this? Be in church. <laughs> how about that? How about that expectation? Actually, be in church. You know, that's an expectation of behavior. We all know the passage, but we're going to go there anyway. Hebrews chapter 10. Anytime church attendance gets brought up, you got to go to this passage. You say, well, where does the Bible say you should be in church? You know, I mean, we all run into people like this. Well, I don't, you know, deer camp's my church. <laughs> I go to church when I go for a hike. No, you don't. You go for a hike when you go for a hike. You go to deer camp when you go to deer camp. You know, your bass boat is not a chapel. None of that is church. But people, we've all met people like this. Say, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about being in church. Well, it actually does. Okay? It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promise, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Now, what is the assembly? It's the church. Those are words that are used, you know, synonymously in Scripture, church and assembly. Okay? It's the same thing. That's what a church is, an assembly. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So as the day is approaching, the evil day, as times get, as perilous times wax worse and worse, is the Bible saying we need more church or less? It says we need more. I mean, in the book of Acts, they got together every day. You know, and they were under a lot of heavy persecution and so on and so forth. I understand that. And here's the thing. I'm not going to get up here and say that if you're not in church three times a week, you're in sin. I, that's not, I can't prove that from, my, from the Bible. You know, and I'm not even saying that that's an expectation of behavior in this church. Now, I've always been a three to thrive guy. I believe in three to thrive. And what I have noticed is that the people that are more committed to more services tend to do better in their spirituality. Now, there's exceptions to every rule. I understand that, okay? And I'm not, you know, here's my expectation of behavior for when it comes to church attendance once a week. Once a week. That is biblical. Go over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> you know, and it's the first day of the week. You know, I believe in the, in the, and look, it doesn't have to be the first day of the week. You say, well, I'll make it, third, I'll make it for the midweek. Fine. I'll make it for the Sunday night. Okay. Sunday morning. Great. But I think going to church once a week is not an unreasonable expectation of behavior. I mean, look at the, all the other things that we do, all the other uh, commitments that we make on a daily basis because it's expected of us. You know, we all go to work every day. You know, we all get up and, you know, you know, wives are keeping house and teaching children. Kids are getting up and doing They all have things that they have to do day in and day out, and they do them. And I don't think asking people to, you know, to show up to church once a week and sit down and, yeah, you have to look at this. I understand. It's tough. But it's the preaching of the Word of God that counts, right? And, and to just sit there, to just sit there and at least pretend that you're listening. You know what I mean? You don't even have to actually be listening. You could fool me, right? You just have to pretend. And, you know, you might actually get something out of it. You might actually get something out of the preaching of the Word of God that you can apply to your Christian life that's going to help you grow. Because here's the thing. You're not going to come to one church service and learn everything you need to know in, in, one, in one service. Now, I know it might feel like I'm trying to teach you everything in one service, right? <laughs> but I try not to. I try to make it about one thing every service. 
but it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That's how the Christian life is. We grow slowly over time. It's measured in decades, not in years. So I think once a week, you know, is a reasonable expectation. It says in Acts 20, verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Now, that's not an expectation of behavior there. I don't have to preach until midnight, okay? I know it might feel like it's going that way, like we're going to high noon, we're not going to high midnight, okay? But, you know, it was what? On the first day of the week, they came together, and Paul preached. This is something we see in Scripture. Uh, you know, go over to 2 Thessalonians 3. I'm going to wrap it up. I'm going long, I know. But we're going to 1 Corinthians 16. I'll, I'll, you're going to 2 Thessalonians 3. But the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 16, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches in Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So Paul's expectations for uh, the churches in Corinth and in Galatia were that they were to lay up in store on the first day of the week, meaning you know what? You had to actually show up to do that. Yet they had, you know, there was no Zell, okay? There was no, you know, wire transfer. There was no, you know, Western Union back then. If you wanted to get the offering in the plate, you had to go to where the plate was and put the offering in it. That was the expectation. That's what I'm getting at here, is that Paul didn't think it was unreasonable for people to show up, what? Once a week, okay? I think that's biblical. Now, how about this one? Be on time for church. Be on time for church. And look, I know things happen. I know that people get busy, you know, whatever. Things happen. We can't, we don't always make it here on time. I understand that. Okay, but, uh, you know, when your habit, as the manner of some is, right, as you said in Hebrews, if your manner is consistently late to church, you know, that, that's, a, that's a, you know, I don't think that's a very good behavior. I think you should be on time for church. I think that people should be, think about all the other things you're on time for. You're on time for work, I hope. You know, if you're, su if you're succeeding at work, you're probably the guy who shows up. And I'll even go a step further and say this. If you're succeeding on the job, you're probably the guy who shows up early. You know, the, the company gets together. You know, I worked at places where every Monday, every, meet, every morning, before we went all to our jobs, we all met at 7 a.m. or whatever it was, 6 a.m. So you're, you're expected to be there, alert, you know, and ready to hear what, the, you know, the day's tasks were. To have the, the jobs doled out, what crew you were going with, where... And you couldn't show up at, at 6.30 because all that information, and they're like, well, where were you? The meeting was at 6. Yeah, I know, but I stayed up late. Or, you know, I didn't set my alarm. Oh, I understand. That's okay. You know, whatever. And, you, oh, and again, things happen. Hey, I was on the way, boss. I got a flat. Oh, sorry to hear that. You know, I apologize. Well, I know that you're consistently here early on time, so it's not a big deal, right? I mean, I remember I had, I, that happened to me once. I had this, it would have sounded like this crazy excuse. The story's coming to me. I'm going to tell it, okay? I had to show up at like 6 a.m. or whatever it was for the company meeting. And I, my, my sister had gone out of town and she asked me to feed her dog and let the dog out in the morning. And this is a very, you know, and she lived kind of like, you know, 20, 30 miles or minutes away from me. And I had just totally forgotten about it. Because it's not something, you know, I don't, you know when things aren't part of your routine then you get asked to do something? You could kind of forget about it. Now you could say, well, you should set an alarm. Well, I didn't have a smartphone, okay? <laughs> you know what I mean? I didn't have all the gadgets. You had to actually just remember things. You know, you had to ask directions to get somewhere or write them down on a sticky note or get out a map, okay? So I remember I was on my way to work and it dawned on me. I've got to go let my, you know, the dog's going to, you know, do what dogs do and tear the place up and everything else. So I had to run over there, let this dog out, and I was like a half hour to an hour late for, for work. And I showed up and the boss was like, where are you? I said, I know it sounds crazy but I had to let my sister's dog out. And he said, you know what? If it was anybody else, I'd call him a liar. He said, because you're consistent. And he said, but you know what? You have such a good track record of being honest about things and, and, and being on time. I believe you. And it was the truth, right? So I don't know where I'm going with all that. <laughs> the point is this, like things happen. I get that, right? But if, you're, if, if I had been the guy who was consistently late all the time and then one day I was just like, well, I'd have let my sister's dog out. You'd be like, pfft come up with something better than that, you know, you liar. And just tell me the truth. You know what I mean? He wouldn't believe me. So we should not be people that are in the manner of, of, of being late. But we should be people that are on time. You know, and let me just say that while I'm on this point, you know, let me just back up the truck a little bit here and unload. Preferably early, okay? Preferably early. You know, there, there's the military saying on time is late. You know, that, uh, that you could apply that to church. And, 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 and 
I'm, like I said, I'm going to step on a little bit of toes this morning, but these are the things that need to be preached, and I don't like to get nitpicky. You know, I'm not going to get nitpicky about a lot of little things, but this is one of them that I am going to get a little nitpicky about. I don't like being the only guy in this building 10 minutes to service. I don't like being the only, my family being the only family here, you know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes to service. And you say, why? Because I'm, because I'm lonely, mm -hmm. right? Because I just can't wait to see you, right? No, I can't wait to see you. I, I love seeing all the brethren and, and, and so on and so forth. But because I don't want to be the only one here when a visitor comes. When that first time visitor shows up and it's an empty building and it's 15 minutes to service, that makes an impression, folks. People walk into churches and they form impressions like that. And look, we got a lot of things working against us when it comes to making first impressions. We're meeting in a small office space with a bunch of derelicts right down the road here, riffraff walking through. We're not in the nicest part of town, which I'm fine with, by the way. I'm just, reality check, this is where we're at, okay, as a church. We've got, you know, this old drop tile ceiling in here. You know, then you got, then they got me, you know. <laughs> then, it's, then it's the sermon. <laughs> you know what I mean? So let's make you know, the, the, the best, the, the more of a good impression we can make right out of the gate, the better. So when they walk in and they see several people here, they see people fellowshipping and talking and greeting one another. You know, that makes a good impression. But if they were to walk in and just see me and my family, they'd think, what's going on here? Say, does that happen? That's happened. There's been people visiting in town. They came in the midweek. You know, and I, and I get it. So not everyone can get here. But if you can, if the only reason you can is just because you don't feel like it, you know, maybe you need to check that. Maybe you need to search your heart a little bit. You know, maybe, maybe you should wonder, if, do you really care about whether or not this church is going to grow? You know, maybe and that's not a big ask. I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation of behavior to say, hey, if you can be here early to make a good impression on any visitor show up, please do so. You know, and, and, you know, pick a service and, and do it. OK, because I've had visitors come out, you know, in the midweek and I know everyone's busy in the midweek. I understand that. Oh, we'll be here Sunday. And it's, you know, five minutes of service. Boom, everybody shows up. And you could just tell the whole time it's just this awkward them looking around. And is anybody else coming? I mean, even the people that come here regularly, when we have a low night, like back in January when everybody was sick, when everyone was out with COVID, there was like, like, there was like a service with like six of us or whatever. Even those of you that were here and have been here regularly for over a year, you even felt awkward. I could tell. <laughs> you were like, are we, I've even been asked, are we still going to have service if it's just us? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we are. If it's just one person in here we're having service. You don't know who you're dealing with. When we had that north location, man, I remember I would go up there, and it was at 8 a.m. in the morning, and you want to talk about a small building. It was smaller than our original one here, right? And, and nobody came to the 8 a.m. service. There was one service, like, consistently it was just me and my family. Then if my wife was sick or the kids were sick and it was just me, I remember it was in one service, and there was nobody there. It was 8 o'clock. It was time to start. I started service. I'm just letting you know who you're dealing with here, in case you ever feel like asking that question again. I started service, and this is my rule. I'm going to sing all the songs. I'm going to do the announcements as if this were a full room, and then I'm going to wait 10, 15 minutes, and if no one shows up, then I'll call it. And I'm sitting there, and I'm halfway through, like, the second song. <clears throat> one guy walks in, and there's nobody else there but me. <laughs> and I just the look on his face, like, and I was just, without even missing a beat, a cappella, no piano. I just kept singing, and I just gestured, have a seat. Went right along, and just went right along with the service. And he sat through the whole thing. Now, he never came back. <laughs> that was it. But, you know, the point is, I'm just making, look, we're going to have service. It makes it a huge, it makes more of an impression that you even might even understand when, you, when this place has more than just me, 10, 15, 20 minutes to service. You know, and say, well, we're on Tucson down here. Well, you know, it's time to get on God's time. Yeah. Tucson time needs to take a hike, okay? And look, we call it Tucson time. It's universal, folks. That, that, that attitude is, it's Hawaiian time, I've been told. It's Filipino time, I've been told. It, look, it's everywhere. Everyone has that. Well, I'll just show up at the very last minute, you know, just barely get there to be on time, okay? I don't want to park it on that, although I just did. So be on time. <coughs> How about some expectations for the children in the service? You know, I, I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation, and we've got a good group of kids. That, that, you know, this is pretty much on point here, but I'm going to bring it up anyway. That kids should be able to sit through an entire service. I think that's not, I do not think that's an unreasonable expectation. In fact, I have kids that do it. I have kids as young as, you know, a two year old, a three year old that can do that. 
that can sit through an entire service without having to get up and get water and without having to get up and go use the potty. Okay, if your child is old enough to go to the bathroom on their own, they're old enough to sit through a service without having to use the potty. And if you're, and if you're letting them do that, guess what you're doing? That's the expectation that you're giving them. That, you know, 15, 20 minutes into the service, I can go take a bathroom break. As soon as my get a little drowsy and he starts droning on about something that I don't care about and I want to just go, you know, to the bathroom to get out of there, then I'm going to do it. Now, look, if there's an emergency, by all means, address the emergency. Otherwise, you know, I'll be dealing with it. <laughs> and I don't want to deal with it. <laughs> okay. But you know what? When we start seeing kids that are consistently getting up over and over again in the service, going to get a glass of water, going to use the bathroom, that's, you know, that's a poor expectation. Kids should be able to sit through a service. Now I get it, you know, especially the evening services and stuff like that. You bring the kids, the younger ones get tired, they fall asleep. I understand, okay? But this, this getting up constantly every time there's a church service, you know, it's, it, I, I think that's a low expectation of behavior. We need to raise that. How about uh, sitting through the service and not in the nursery? Okay, not in the nursery. The nursery is for, well, it's a nursery, right? So it's for nurslings. It's for kids who are nursing, Okay. It's not for the three-year-old. It's not. I know there's toys and things in there, and if that needs to go, they'll go. But, you know, it's it's not for it. You know, to go have playtime with the toddlers and such. You know, you should be. That's a place of training, and it's. By the way, it's not a place for ladies to talk during the service. By the way, it's not a place for ladies to go in there and have a quiet conversation while the preacher's preaching. That's why I've got a little microphone there, so you can still. That's why there's a window. It's not just so I can. It's not for me to look in there and say like, what's going on in there, and so you can look out here and see what's going on out here. Okay, so the nursery is, you know, is for nurslings. I think it's a reasonable expectation that, you know, children uh, should graduate from that room. That should be the goal. Now, if there's a time of training that needs to take place, you need to make use of that room and go over there and teach and train, so be it. But it's not playtime in there, okay, during the church service. The goal should be to get them out here. Otherwise, they're going to miss Ephesians, children obey your parents. They're going to miss Colossians, children obey your parents. I mean, if I'm a parent, I want them to hear that, right? I want them to hear the obey your parents part, okay? But that takes place in here, okay, when people are paying attention. Another just quick one for the kids. How about no running in the church? No running, okay? And look, this is especially important here because, we're, you know, it's important everywhere, but we have a very limited space of, of walking, right? There's not a lot of room in here. You know, if, if little Johnny comes, no offense to anyone named Johnny, comes running around the corner, you know, I might have to dive on somebody else to get out of the way, right? because we're kind of tight in here, okay? We have expectant ladies walking around. You know, there are people, you know, me, I'm a bit of a gimp right now with this, this hip flexor thing. I'm not exactly, you know, you thought I, was, I wasn't light a foot before. I'm especially, you know, gimpish now, right? Like, I'm not gonna be able to just dive out of the way. I don't wanna have to do a header over your kid because they have been taught not to run in church, okay? Don't run in church. And now here's just one for everybody, okay? I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation for people to clean up after themselves. Now, I'm not saying every, you know, it's your turn to get the vacuum or your turn to wipe down the glass or dust the piano. You know, I'm here for all that. I'm glad to do that. You know, I'm not saying it's your turn to straighten out the hymnals or, you know, put them back uh, or, you know, flip the chairs over and dust all the legs. Okay, but how about just clean up after yourself? How about, you know, maybe when you get up, look at the floor, you know, especially if you have kids. Did my kids throw it? Did my kids tear up the bulletin and throw it on the floor? Did they tear a corner off of a piece of paper and bought it up? Did my kids put gum on the floor? You know, or, or maybe, did I do that? <laughs> Whatever. Did, did you do that? Did you leave you know, a half-drunk water bottle on the sink? And, you know, the trash can's right over there. You know, I don't think that's an... Un and again, I'm not going to... This is like a once-in-a-while sermon. This isn't something... But since I'm on the subject, I want to get it over with. You know? Clean up after yourself. How about you know, don't leave the, uh, uh, the, the food and drink in the fridge? You know, I'll use the fridge. And look... I know some people are sweating right now when I brought that up. This is multiple people. Okay, this isn't just one person. That's why I got to preach it. Okay, you know, clean the fridge. What I see by clean fridge is get your stuff out of it. I don't expect you to open up the fridge and, and wipe down. I'll do that. But could you just take your leftovers with you that have been there for a week, two weeks? Could you take your personal beverage home? You know, or how about this personal belongings that get left behind? You know, I don't think it's an unreasonable expectation for people to look before they leave and say, am I forgetting something? Am I forgetting a hat, a coat, or whatever? And I bring all this up because I've been in church for a while now, like 20 years or something like that, almost 20 years. And I know how people are, and it's not, it's not bad, it's not sinful, it's just 
if we don't talk about these things, they never change. Because that's the expectation I set. Oh, Brother Corbin's fine with us just taking a sip out of the water bottle and leaving the whole thing there. You know, there's a, if you just need a sip of water, there's a water cooler. And I know there was a stint where I missed a bottle. I apologize, okay? But it's got a water cooler. It's full. There's another bottle on the way. I'll make sure I do that. If you just need a sip or two, grab a cup instead of going and then putting it there and forgetting about it, you know, because those are intended for soul winners. And again, I don't want to turn into this nitpicky preacher up here, but we got to talk about these things every once in a while. And maybe I took a little time long, too long getting there, but, you know, it is what it is. I had to lay the groundwork. <coughs> Pick up after yourselves, clean, so on and so forth. You know the deal. Uh, go to, where do I have you go? First Thessalonians? Okay. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians, verse 3, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. You know, Paul made a point of behaving himself a certain way around the Thessalonians so that they would follow him. What is he doing? He's setting an expectation of behavior. And we see that consistently through the Bible, that there is consistently an expectation of behavior in church, in our personal lives, so on and so forth. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. He said, You are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblamingly what? We behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we, have, uh, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. He said, look, you know how we behaved, and then we in turn, what? We set a standard. We said, here's an expectation as a father doth his children. You know, that's what a good dad does. He sets a standard. He exhorts. He says, son, daughter, this is the bar. Meet it. I'll help you, I'll help you do it. Why? That you would walk worthy of God who hath called us, called you unto his kingdom and glory. So what is the point of having expectations of behavior? It's to glorify God, right? That we would walk worthy of God. That we would be, have a good reputation with them that are without. That we would be known as people who have, uh, they could say, hey, those people at Faithful Word in Tucson, they're a certain way, you know, and, they're, and, they're, and they're referring to a good way. They behave themselves well. They have a certain expectation behavior. And I'm not saying something over the top, and it's going to become some you know, self-righteous behavior. But I'm just saying, like, hey, when they go there, you know, that place, they, they treat it with respect. You know, they treat their, their, their preacher with respect. And everyone does. You know, and, I, and, I, and I don't feel slighted in that way. You know, I'm just saying, that should be our reputation. You know, we should be people that have known that there's a certain expectation of here. And, and in turn, people would glorify God because of it. That, that people say, glory to God for the way that people behave. So, <clears throat> because here's the thing, in a church or out of church, you know, your behavior is a testimony to those around you. So, you know, it's not unreasonable that you should have a certain expectation for that behavior. Let's go ahead and pray.